Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Welcome back for this Sabbath study. As we return to this portion of the study in Ezekiel 33, as we consider carefully this that is being presented for our admonition, shall we praise our Heavenly Father, being so patient, so kind, so loving, that we have the time to address this, to consider this, and to take this in for ourselves. We are before a very important time in this earth's history, but it's also very fearful. Shall we now ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his direction and his blessing as we open his word? Loving Father in heaven, We assemble before you and we thank you for these Sabbath hours. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to study together, to consider different points, and to be blessed by that which your prophets have presented. Help us now so that in all of these things we may consider and become unified. We need your guidance. We need your direction. We ask, Father, that the Holy Spirit may open our minds, that your angels may attend us, that your will may be done in our lives, so that your name and your character may be glorified. Help us to this end. Direct us now, for we need you. Thank you for these opportunities. Thank you for the blessing of being able to come before you. For this, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now we covered part of this last week, so let's refresh our memories a little bit. The Lord declares, the children of thy people say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Here now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? Have I any pleasure at all in in that the wicked should die? And not that he should return from his ways and live? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be found, shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Therefore, turn yourself and live ye. Here the Lord is plainly revealed his will concerning the salvation of the sinner. And the attitude which many assume in expressing doubts and unbeliefs as to whether the Lord will save them is a reflection upon the character of God. Those who complain of his justice and severity are virtually saying the way of the Lord is not equal. But he distinctly throws back the imputation upon the si- upon the sinner. Your ways are not equal. Can I pardon your transgressions when you do not repent and turn from your sins? When we are considering this, many times we pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Many times we are asking for this to occur, yet has true repentance occurred as we are asking for this, how can we experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit if we have an issue between ourselves and our brothers? I offer this on a personal level. There were a lot of things that occurred this last week that surprised many of us. How can we look to experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit if we are not willing to be unified with one another. Well, um, go ahead. Yeah, so just to sort of address this a little bit. Um, you know, I, I had a conversation with, with Colin, I think it was yesterday, you know, because I mean, him and I are friends. And, uh, you know, so I asked him about, you know, what had happened and, and what how, what his experience was uh, in regard to what, Jeff had done. And and there was a couple of points, you know, that that he brought out that were important. So first, he didn't feel that uh, 
the, the conversation he had with Jeff on the phone was 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 a conflict. So he was kind of surprised at Jeff's reaction. But also, you know, we've had people, you know, who've been following Jeff for a lot of years and they were just, you know, cut out. You know, if if you're going to want to minister to people, it doesn't really make sense to cut yourself off from them. Right. And, you know, of course, that's always been my approach, not, not just within this movement, but everywhere. You know, if I'm at, at odds with persons or they're at odds with me, I, I don't cut off communication from them. I try to communicate with them. You know, one is there's many things that I need to learn. So when, when I became an Adventist, I, I, I'm not really that, I'm not a social person, right? I, I can have a little bit of contact with people, but, but I don't need a lot of contact with people. And definitely a church uh, is an environment that uh, doesn't suit my nature. My nature is is more solitary. There's a lot of complexities having to deal with other people. But I recognize that it was necessary for my Christian life to be in contact with others. Uh, there was no way that I was going to develop a Christ-like character uh, being a hermit, as much as, you know, it's it's desirable from a nature point of view. And, and also the differences in people are extremely important, even, even if they can be unpleasant, right? So, you know, God has, has put us in this world to, to witness to people and to be witnessed to. So there's lots that I've learned from my contact with others about myself, my own character, and about other people's character and how to reach them. And, and I don't think it makes sense to cut ourselves off from people, especially over minor disagreements. Now, there's a lot of it, a lot of difference. I mean, there is this text that people throw around. Uh, you know, how can two walk together except they be agreed? And they use this text as a reason to cut themselves off from others. But I, I take the text, I read it quite differently. That if you want to work with others, if you want to walk with others, you need to learn how to come into agreement. Right? There's nothing about that text that tells us, tells us to just cut off people you don't agree with. So if we are going to be Christians, if we're going to overcome our natures, if we're going to overcome our sin, we need to recognize that that happens on the horizontal level. We need the vertical. We need our connection with God. Uh, but the cross is not just uh, a connection with God. It's also a connection with others. And, and Christ came into this world uh, taking up a cross. And, and we are to have our cross as well. And, and by the way, you know, Colin and I had a good conversation. I actually agree with Colin's position. And, and Jeff used to teach the same thing that Colin's saying now regarding, you know, who modern Rome is. So I found it kind of odd. In all of this situation, if we look at what occurred before the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. did Simon Peter cast out Matthew for disagreeing with him over choice of employment. <laughs> no. Did Simon Peter cast out Simon Zelotus, Simon the Zealot, over his political views? No. Did Simon Peter or any of the disciples cast out Mary of Beth Bethany. No. These examples are given for our admonition today. These came into unity in order to give the message that was necessary. They prepared. They prayed together. They confessed sins. So if they, if they had a problem with somebody else, they confessed it. They didn't cast people out. This whole situation has been difficult. <clears throat> when July 20, 
or July 18th, 2020 happened. And Elder Jeff decided that he was the leper outside the camp. It was very much a confusing time, but there were some that wanted to cast others out and some that wanted to come together and study. The more we follow after what has occurred before, coming together in study, in prayer, in fellowship with our brothers and sisters, the more we will be prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Here are his promises, plain and definite, rich and full, but they are all upon conditions. If you comply with the conditions, can you not trust the Lord will fulfill his word? Let these blessed promises set in the framework of faith be placed in memory's hall. None, not one of them will fail. All that God has spoken, he will do. He is faithful that he has promised. Can we say amen to that? Mm -hmm. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here again is a conditional promise. Will we claim it? You need wisdom that you may not err in your confessions of sin. Jesus, your Savior, is to be your confessor. There are some sins that need to be confessed to men. If we have wronged one another, we are to make confession to him. We have, have we injured or defrauded our neighbor? We should not only confess the sin, but make restitution. The work which you have to do on your part is plainly set before you. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he hath robbed, Walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Now, from steps to Christ. Confession will not be acceptable to God without sincere repentance and reformation. There must be decided changes in the life. Everything offensive to God must be put away. This will be the result of genuine sorrow for sin. The work that we have to do on our part is plainly set before us. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that which he had robbed, walk in the statue of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Paul says, speaking of the work of repentance, ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things, you have appointed yourselves to be clear in this matter. 2 Corinthians 7.11. If we cannot confess without sincerely repenting and seeing a reformation in our lives, we are no better than those that have refused the message of God. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Said Jesus, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Here again, we are returning to letter 20 of 1889. And again, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons, which need no repentance. Luke 15, 7. Will you not believe these precious words? Will you not receive them into your heart? Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. 
Is not this promise broad and deep and full? Can you ask for more? Will you not allow the Lord right here to erect a standard for you against the enemy? Satan is ready to steal away the blessed assurances of God. He desires to take every glimmer of hope and every ray of light from the soul. But you must not permit him to do this. Exercise faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Wrestle with these doubts. Become acquainted with the promises. How many of us are fully acquainted with these promises? How many of us have allowed these promises full entrance into our hearts? When I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trusts to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all of his righteousness shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. If he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Wherewith, wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed me, O oh man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? When Satan comes in to tempt you to give up all hope, point him to these words. Okay, now from, from part of what we read just a little bit ago, a comment from the chat is saying, I figure revenge in 2 Corinthians 7.11 should be translated as vindication. In other words, the Lord forgives the penitents, in a sense, vindicating them and restoring them to his favor. Any other thought on that? Yeah, well, that's vindication or retribution. Okay. Now, about this from Micah. How many of us have been tempted at times to give up all hope? How many times do we see this with people? That they feel that their case is hopeless. Now, um, you know, sometimes, of course, that that is part of coming to God, right? Right. We give up on ourselves. And um, now it talks here about assurances. She's talking about uh, to lose that assurance. You know, we have the full assurance of faith and the assurance of hope, which which is is a sort of an oxymoron. That is uh, because hope is is not really the same as assurance. Right. But the Bible says that hope is assurance. And even faith, um, you know, if you think of assurance uh, as like, you know, if you go to the bank and you want to take out a loan, they're not generally going to do it by faith, no. right? They're going to want to have some collateral, right? So they want some assurance that, you know, you're going to pay back that loan. But God has this assurance that comes by faith, that comes by hope. That is, it's more certain than, you know, the promises definitely of man, even when they're secured, you know, with some with some kind of uh, security. Right. <laughs> if that makes sense. Well, generally, a bank is going to look in their security to the collateral that's offered. Yeah. yeah. So there's, but even that collateral could maybe. Uh, not be worth anything, you know, if we, if we were lending money to somebody and they give us something as collateral. I mean, at some point, the thing they give it cla as collateral may not have the value that it had at one time or other, right? Correct. But uh, when it comes to God's promises, um, those are very certain because of who God is. And if we come to know God, that we can trust in his promises, 
we can have the full assurance of faith or the assurance of hope. Hope is hardly even faith, right? I mean, hope is just hoping <laughs> that, you know, that something is true or that, but, but it says that we can have the assurance of hope. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting because this is based upon who God is, not upon who we are. Uh, the reality is that we're nothing like God, but God promises us everything. Okay. Now, this next document is a non-published. It was published on the first day of the first month of the biblical year, 5953. So it's written then? I mean, like, what is this? This is a letter 120, so it was written April 3rd, 1908? Correct. Yeah, because you, you said published, but it's not okay. published. So. <laughs> well, to me, published, I mean, would be the same thing as when it's written because it's sent out. Uh, okay. Well, this one might not even have been sent out then. She would have written it then. Um, but, yeah, whether she sent it out that day or not. Who did she okay. write this to? That I don't remember. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, it's interesting here, of course, we have letter 120. A little time is yet granted us in which to prepare for the future life and to meet the Lord when he shall come in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. Are we preparing to meet the Lord with joy? Now, does the symbol of 120 mean anything to us? A restoration. Okay. Well, it's not restoration. That'd be 220. The 120 oh. would be at Pentecost. Yeah, even in probationary time, that could give those in the time of no. Okay, yeah. Yes, so, agreed. Probationary time. And that's, that's exactly what I was looking for. So... This being probationary is important for us to recognize. Spiritual things must be spiritually discerned. We each need an individual knowledge of what the Lord requires of us. We cannot continue to do as we please and still be prepared to meet him when he comes. Now is our time and opportunity to be gaining an experience in the things of God. I feel great grief for Frank Belden. I cannot, but I cannot advise you, Emma, even for your sister's sake, to place yourself under his influence. He has made his choice. If he ever changes that choice, we shall know it by his actions. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Ezekiel 33:16. I ask you to study the 34th chapter of Ezekiel. When you feel that the time has come for you to leave Nashville, we will receive you gladly. We have quite a company of workers in the office who must be paid for their services. There is great need that my books now in preparation be published. I ask the Lord to help me understand my duty and to do it. I shall certainly make some changes. Now, a couple of years later, we have letter 104 of 1910, written on the 18th of October, which was the 14th day of the seventh month. Here she states, I'm trying to complete some unfinished chapters on Old Testament history. I am hoping that I shall be able to get together matter for the completion of a book covering the ground between the end of David's reign and the birth of Christ. There is a world to be warned, and we are 20 years behind in doing this work. What is she saying here? 20 years earlier from 1910 would have placed this reference as when. From the chat, it says 1890. So is this not a reference looking back at the fact that in 1888, a message most precious had been given and that by 1910 she was recognizing that that message st had yet still to go out our work will be harder now than it would have been for difficulties have arisen that did not then exist the years are rapidly passing bearing away their record for eternity Wherever you see work to be done, do your very best after the order of Christ. 
Place yourselves under the discipline of God. He who professes to be a Christian and yet acts out the spirit of a worldling bears testimony that he is a false disciple. We are to be consecrated workers according to the charge given in the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel. So, thou son of man, I have set thee a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus speak ye, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how shall we then live? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the, of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. For the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Now, when it says here, Say unto the children of thy people. What else are we seeing here in this in this passage? The children of thy people. Very much like what we've been discussing from Daniel eleven fourteen. Are these the sons of thy people? Are these all of the children? How are we to approach this? How do we look at this passage? So you're asking how is yeah, it's the same word, sons, if that's okay. Right. Um, I'm pretty sure. Just hang on a second. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I'm not sure why they translate it. Children, they're just taking sons to be the general sort of term, even though it's, it's you know, it's a masculine word. But um, it's just, it, it's more an idiomatic expression than anything in this context, it's different than the sons of, of the breakers or the sons of the robbers. Um, Cause it's not, it's, I, I guess the idea is that it, it implies a descent uh, from Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, you know, a continuation oh. of these being God's people. That's what you're getting at. Well, when, when I'm looking at this, it's interesting because we have Hebrew 1121 and Hebrew 5971. So we have Bain Am. Would that be correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, that's the, it's, it's not quite that in, in Hebrew because there's some grammatical things, but yeah, those are the basic words. I find it an interesting thought comes to mind that it's the, uh, sons of God and Babylon has daughters daughters of Babylon and sons of God okay. sure the Bible talks about the daughters of God but in Genesis they speak often of the sons of God and the daughters of men especially when we are looking at the time of Enoch is this not also giving us a reference of the type of separation that is needed for us to be separate from the world? Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die if he turn from his skin, his sin and do that which is lawful and right. If the wicked restore the pledge and give again 
that which he had robbed. Walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity. He shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Now here again, she becomes very pointed. Had the message gone forth as the Lord specified that it should go in the power of the spirit, thousands would have been brought into a knowledge of the truth. The message in 1888 from on high, the message most precious, had it gone forth as the Lord had specified it should go, thousands would have been brought into the knowledge of the truth. The Lord gave me a message to bear at the last general conference. Some of the leading men did not cooperate with me, but I held up the work that God desired to see done by converted men, men who could demonstrate the power of the Christian religion. So which general conference session was, re was she referring to? Was there already a 1910 general conference? Or was this earlier from this point? Heaven is to be reflected in the character of the Christian. In the way Christ worked, he is to work. Our cause should be years in advance of what it is. It was God's plan that those in darkness should see great light. A wonderful work might have been done had the leading man been under the Holy Spirit's guidance. Now, what is she saying here? I thought that all of the leading men of the conference are appointed directly by God. But is she saying here that those at that time, that people looked that they should be appointed by God, that they were not under the Spirit's guidance? Okay, from it the reminds me of... Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. No, you're, go ahead. It reminds, me, it reminds me of uh, reading when Ellen White was... She was uh, rebuking, rebuking the 1888 General Conference men for not wanting to discuss righteousness by faith, the topic that they had gathered together for, or the law of God and righteousness by faith. Um, and they didn't want to discuss it because Elder Butler was not there. And what did she say? Should we not discuss this because one man is not here? And what was your question you asked it? It reminded me of it. Okay. My question was, since this letter was written in 1910, which of the general set conference sessions could she be referring to? And from the chat, and I thank you, sister, it's noted that the 1909 general conference session is the last one that she attended. Yeah. And it couldn't, I, I haven't been able to find a 1910 general conference. Okay. Not sure when. I'm trying to find that out. So here she states, a wonderful work might have been done had the leading men been under the Holy Spirit's guidance. A wonderful work would have been done if the leading men had been under the Holy Spirit's guidance. If the messages given me had been received, the good tidings of the gospel should have been born in many places, and bright rays of heavenly light would have shone into the darkness. Songs of praise would have been heard from many lips. Many souls in our great cities, wearied and perplexed, not knowing what is true, would have heard the glad tidings of the gospel. Had the light. Yeah, that's, I'm sorry here, Dwight. So just uh, a little point. They used to have the general conference sessions every two years. Okay. And then after 1905, they had them every four years, roughly. So 1909, then 1913, then 1918. So that's five years, then 1922, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. Have the light given by God been heated? Strong, well-organized companies would have been sent out into the cities 
to take the truth to those in the darkness of error. But the opportunity that the Lord presented to his people in messages that he sent them was not accepted. It's amazing. Here again, man believed themselves to be wiser than God. Are we not seeing that today? Now, the comment from the chat. Jeremiah 10, 21, and I'm assuming Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24, regarding rebellious pastors and self-exalting people. Are we seeing this today? So here's Jeremiah 10, 21. Couldn't that, couldn't that be all of us, Dwight? We can Amen, all, brother. We can all have that same spirit. No disagreement, brother. I am in full agreement with what you just said. Jeremiah 10, 21. For the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper and their flocks shall be scattered. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. In fact, let's start with Jeremiah 9.22. Speak, thus saith the Lord, even the carcass of men shall fall as dung upon the open field, and as the handful after the harvestmen, and none shall gather them. Thus saith the Lord, not let the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glory Glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For these things I delight, saith the Lord. Have we anything in ourselves to commend ourselves to God? Letter 30, 1895. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth the law, also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God neither he that loveth not his brother. 1 John 3, 3 to 8 and 10. Read the whole chapter, for it will be applied to your case by the Holy Spirit of God. Read also Ezekiel 33, 1 to 16. Let the Holy Spirit come into your heart and abide there, and let Satan be expelled from the soul temple. If you will open the door of your heart to Jesus, you may enjoy the richest blessing. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. And white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man heareth my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Revelation 3, 18 to 21. Now, what's the purpose of our study at this point in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 33? At the outset, this addresses addresses the watchman, the the responsibility of the watchman. And and it's in the context, of course, uh, where uh, the escapee has returned from the destruction of Jerusalem. When we started this, we had gone through a good bit of Ezekiel 9. 
Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Now, Ezekiel 8 and 9 and following chapters are one vision. But it, this is a vision describing work. Ezekiel 8, 9 and the following chapters is that work that God approves. Um, no, because there's a judgment upon it. If I understand here, your question. Here in Ezekiel 33, Mrs. White is very clear because this chapter is showing us the work that God does approve. So the expelling of Satan from the soul temple. Correct. Where in Ezekiel 8, the Satan has taken house in God's temple. Correct. Now let's consider this. Mrs. White is presenting that we need to understand not only 1 John 3, but Ezekiel 33. Mm -hmm. But now she is merging what is necessary with Ezekiel 33 with Revelation 3, 18 to 21. As she's going through this, if Ezekiel 33 is the work that God approves, why didn't she merge this with the Philadelphian message rather than the Laodicean message? Is she not because telling us... Excuse it's me? It's the message for our time. Yes, it it's is. It's the message for Laodicea for our time. Or the Laodicean church. Yes. Isn't, isn't she telling us that the Laodicean that repents can do the work that God approves? Yeah, if we heed the message, yeah. It's Laodicea that will do the work once they repent. Now, what happens if we turn back to the Philadelphian message? I would think they would have to deny light behind them to go back. Okay. Well, well you can't go back to the Laodicean mess or to the uh, Philadelphian message when you're a Laodicean because the Philadelphians have mm -hmm. no rebuke. And, and we need to heed, you know, Ellen White says, uh, this is in Christian Experience and Teachings of Ellen G. White. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen, and I was shown it was caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Right. So that message has to be heard. If we don't think we're Ra Laodiceans, then we're not going to heed that message. And and if we say we're not Laodiceans, uh, it's a dead giveaway that we are. Because we're saying we're rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, which means we're laid to sins. You, you can't get around it. God has laid weighty responsibilities upon men who are placed in positions of trust. They are to watch for souls as they that must give an account. They must be endowed with the Holy Spirit, which is the appointed agency through whom men may represent Christ in all places and at all times. If we are not endowed with the Holy Spirit, if we are not imbued with the Holy Spirit, how can we represent the character of God? Christ said to his disciples, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not in me. John 16, 7 to 9. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John three sixteen. The Holy Spirit will reprove of righteousness because I go to the Father, and ye see me no more, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged by the Lord God of heaven and by the whole angelic family. John 16, 10, and 11. We have addressed many points. The major points I leave with you today, if we look to do the work that God would have before us, 
as he is showing us in Ezekiel 33, then we need to be accepting of the message that is presented to the church of Laodicea. We need this complete and total reformation of character. It starts with us, each one individually. Okay, I see a hand up. Please proceed with your question. May have been an accident. Okay. All right. We are coming close to our the end of our time right now. Do we have any other thoughts or comments or questions at this point? Uh, just a, a comment regarding this uh Philadelphia and Laodicean sort of controversy. So the idea that, that Jeff has is that Philadelphia, that they're now Philadelphians, which means that there is no rebuke. And yet they have divisions. Right. Which, which isn't really consistent with that idea. And, and it's actually done based on uh, a false pretense. So. You know, there's a lot of problems with the idea that we don't need to heed the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans that somehow we're, we're okay. Um, and, and I've recognized this. I mean, this idea has been around for a long time, uh, at least, you know, as long as I've been an Adventist. And, and you know, I, I'm pretty sure that Jeff rejected it as error in the past. So I'm kind of puzzled that he believes that, you know, they're now Philadelphians based upon, you know, the eighth, which, of course, is a riddle. You can't take for every seventh that there is always an eighth. Correct. So it's um, and even then, the eighth isn't really one of the seven kings. It's it it's, you know, proceeded from them is supported from them because the. The seven kings, being the presidents of the United States, are going to make an image to the beast. So um, it's not really a resurrection of one of the seven, as people have interpreted it. So it, it would create all kinds of problems if we tried to apply an eighth to every seven. Okay. Now, a comment from the chat is that we should look at Job 9, verse 20. If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. And that's also 9 verse 20. That's the 20th day of the ninth month. That's yeah. as well, where they're called to repentance uh, for the marriage to the strange wives in Ezra, Ezra chapter yes. 9. Or not chapter, chapter 10. So it's on the 20th day of the ninth month in Ezra chapter 10. Isn't it surprising how so many of these symbols come together? We have a choice. We can either say we're not Laodicean and turn our backs on light, or we can accept the fact that we are Laodicean and seek that we want the Holy Spirit to abide with us and in our hearts so that we may, understanding the corruption that is in our heart and our mind be cleansed and have the gifts that are being presented. Okay, early writings 270. What what is your thought there, brother? Uh <clears throat> yeah. Uh Theodore had mentioned this this first part of this quote that I asked the meaning of the shaking and had seen and was shown that it was caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Um, but some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it, and this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. And I'm not – see, I, I've read this as it's the rising up against the testimony that causes the shaking. Or yeah. is it the message itself, right? No, it's, it's okay. the rising up against against the message. So, of course, the, that, we have to exalt the standard first and pour forth the straight truth. But it's it's those that do not bear the straight testimony that causes the shaking, right? So it's not that the message of the Laodiceans causes the shaking because it, it is a message that brings about conversion. It's not a divisive message. But those that rise up against the message 
are the ones that cause the division, the separation, the shaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's an interesting thought that that's what causes the, the shaking. So when you see people rejecting it, it's causing the shaking. Yeah, it's causing that the logic. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Our time is at a close. Shall we now close with a word of prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we ask, Father, for your forgiveness, for our hardness of heart, for thinking that there's anything that we can do that we commend ourselves to you. Direct us on this Sabbath. Help us that that which we do may help us to come into a closer walk with you individually and together. Be with us now. Guide this next message. Help us that we may listen and we may understand. May your will be done. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.